He's still at the front if anyone's interested in a front row. Wow. Brilliant. Okay. Well, we've got a lot to get through tonight, so um, let's, uh, let's get started. So, uh, first of all, welcome to Digital Taunton. Welcome to season two. Um, wow. Every month we do this, the numbers are growing and growing. I don't think I've ever been, at least in Somerset, to a networking event that's been going for over a year that is increasing its numbers month on month. It's, uh, it's so exciting and uh, it's amazing that all of you um, are a part of it. I just want to get something out of the way first of all because Jeremy's been winding me up about this all day. So first of all, I've had a, I'm just going to pre-warn you, I, I don't know why I'm going for a bit of a phase around shapes at the moment, so there might be a few shapes tonight going on. Um, but does anyone see anything? Anyone see? Be interesting to see who's the creative people in the room. Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> so, Jeremy, uh, I did this at like midnight, and for me, it's a random collection of shapes uh, that I threw onto a canvas and went, yeah, it's all right. And then Jeremy phoned me up and go, mate, I love what you did with that train. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you on about? He goes, no, honestly, that train on Twitter. It's really good. Um, I don't know what you're on about. And he had to phone me and really talk me through the process that he sees a train. Um, but apparently some other people do as well. So brilliant. You're not. And there's like eight of these tonight. So um, maybe there'll be a couple of other things as well. It's not the first time, is it? Uh, what, trains? Oh, yeah, no, a couple of months ago, I accidentally drew a cock and balls. Um, <laughs> it was meant to be a, it was a Venn diagram with an arrow. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bit of feedback on that one that month, that was lovely. Um, so, um, I just want to, you know, once again, thank you to everyone that's here tonight. It's, uh, it's buzzing in here, absolutely buzzing. Um, just wanted to know, I like to do this every time, hands up if this is your first time. Wow. Most of the room. So you got a busy weekend because you got to binge watch season one now, okay? No Netflix, no you season two or sec whatever, the sex education, that's another good show. Get on Facebook and watch, watch season... No, it's a show, it's like comedy, it's not... <laughs> it's not educational. I'm sure there's a bunch of those as well on Netflix. Um, but yeah, uh, so wow, that's a massive, massive turnout of first-timers. So um, yeah, brilliant. First of all, just wanted to change things up. This month, the first month, um, I wasn't sure if this slide was actually going to make it because I was just waiting for the nods to be told that it's actually working. Oh, no, thumbs up. So we're on, we're on YouTube now. So, um, so we always live stream our events. It's a, it's a big part of what we enjoy doing. It's, it's kind of cool, and I love seeing the gear at the back, and John does a fantastic job. And so we were on uh, Facebook, as most of you, half of you maybe know. And so this year, we're going to switch it up. We're going to be... Uh, live streaming on YouTube. The quality is a lot better. There's so much more cool things you can do with it and hopefully people can find it on Google a lot easier whereas on Facebook it's an absolute pain in the ass. So, um, so actually one of the things I was going to ask is that it's a brand new YouTube account so please go onto YouTube, just like, subscribe, do the ding notification bell thing. Um, I would actually put the URL to access it on the screen but when you're a new channel, the URL is literally like this long. It's all a mess. And it isn't until you get 100 subscribers that you can have like a sexy URL and stuff. So, so hopefully, if we can like get 100 subscribers, we can have a, a URL that would be worth sharing with people. But if you search for it on Twitter, I'm, I think all the so it's across all the socials as we speak. Also, social media, it's a big part of what we do. Um, Digital Taunton is about building a brand. It's about, it's about sort of bringing together a bunch of people, creating a community and a message. And a key part of that is doing it through social media. So if you're tweeting tonight, Instagramming, selfies, TikTok, Bebo's, Facebook's, Friends Reunited, any of those old things, um, make sure you use the hashtag Digital Taunton and then that way we can look at it all tomorrow morning and, and just really in awe of all of it. So tonight, We've got a really, really good lineup and quite a bit to get through. So we've got two multi-award winning, best-selling authors, social media pros. It's a real, we're really sort of lucky tonight. And, um, and we're among some of the, uh, 
Well, I'd like to say the sort of all-stars of season one. Um, we've got a couple of familiar faces back with us tonight. We've got uh, Kendall McDonald, who spoke here about six months ago, I think it was. Um, absolutely fantastic talk about buying behavior and psychology and all kinds of really good stuff. And then we've got Joe, our other keynote speaker this evening, talking about all kinds of good stuff around social media. We've got two spotlight talks tonight. So for those in the room that don't know, what we'd like to do, and we only usually do one, um, we do something called a spotlight talk. And essentially, it's just uh, a 10 minute slot reserved for a really interesting initiative or program that's happening locally that somehow feeds into the kind of mission of Digital Taunton. So we've got some people here from Bridgewater and Taunton College tonight. Um, is it Dave? Four of them turned up and they're all doing rocks as a paper at the back of the room to decide who was talking. <laughs> I think it landed on Dave, was it? The, yeah, that one, wasn't it? Um, so, um, so he's gonna be talking about some really cool stuff, what the college are doing. And we have Mark from the Somerset West and Taunton Council. Yes, got it right. Um, talking about a really interesting thing, very, very timely, very, very important, and you all need to know about it. So first of all, just wanna, um, for those who don't know, my name is Shane Griffiths, and I'm a, a digital product designer and co-founder of a small team called the Idea Bureau. Uh, we're a remote company, and we work with clients all over the place. And, um, and essentially what we do is we design and build apps and websites and digital services for public sector, private sector, governments, advocacy organizations, um, charities, NGOs, all that kinds of stuff. When I'm not doing that, with this handsome chap, um, we're running Digital Taunton. So, um, so we created Digital Taunton alongside a team of really great people that helped achieve this. And, um, and we're really, really proud, actually, of what we've managed to achieve in a very, very short space of time. We only started this in February 20, well, last February. So, um, so yeah, so it was a really busy year last year. We, um, we decided to take a break at, at December. There was no event in December. I decided to just stay at home and binge watch uh, Netflix. And uh, Jeremy decided to do a little bit of hiking. Um, managed to... Um, so... <laughs> The problem with Facebook is that, hey, if it's off Facebook, it's anyone's game, I reckon. And, <laughs> and I don't know, like, I don't, I think he should stick to the day job. Um, I think he was trying to show off in front of his kids. Um, and the dog was loving it. What I found out, that his whole family were just stood there just filming the whole thing. I mean, it's, it's the bit where he lands hand saying, I want a minute. And there. So, um, yeah, so uh, we like to banter each other a little bit, and it's my turn tonight. So, um, so that's me and Jeremy. Um, and we're also supported by uh, some really, really great people that really couldn't, uh, tonight really wouldn't happen if it wasn't for these people here. So the Idea Bureau, the team that I work with, Ben at the back, Natasha, who's um, actually remote from Southampton. She's actually working on Digital Southampton tonight. So um, she lives in Southampton and works remotely with me, but she's really passionate about her stuff. We've got Claims Consortium Group and Jeremy's company, and there's a lot of CCG here tonight, I think, represent. And, um, and we've got ADPR as well. They're a fantastic local PR company that pretty much, there they are. Uh, they would have greeted you uh, this evening with, with, I'm sure, lots of smiles. Uh, they do a lot of our strategy, project management, because Jeremy and I are crap at that, and, um, and help sort of facilitate a lot of the technical stuff. We've got Intro Tweet, Pete and Laura, fantastic local business that do a lot for us in terms of social media. And we have Ian, photography at the back right there. Get it? Good man. Um, he's fantastic, month in, month out. Thank you to our hosts, Company Spaces. Uh, they've been our, it's been our home for nearly a year now. Absolutely great what they do for us. Jonathan Warner at the back doing the live stream. And Rough Tools, who usually is Sam, who does our audio, but he's not here with us tonight, but Ben's taking care of all that, so all good. So thank you to those people. So the goal is really, like I mentioned, is, um, is to develop a brand, a message, um, bringing people together. So, you know, for us, it's like we want to make Taunton and the surrounding areas a 
to be recognized as a, a center of excellence for innovation and collaboration and tech in the Southwest and, and beyond. And, uh, and this kind of idea that there is life south of Bristol, right? Um, and that's kind of something that we're really, really keen on because it really pisses us off when people say that it's crap around here, right? And, and it's not, it's just, it isn't uh, assembled, I think is probably one way to put it. So we, we, we try and, you know, trying to cultivate, I guess, a community of highly skilled digital workers that can add value to the businesses that they work for and maybe add value to others as well. And we do this by um, linking with education and bridging that gap between industry and education is something that's very key. We, I guess, like to see ourselves as kind of evangelists for the local digital economy. And we spend a lot of time building relationships with regional stakeholders around that whole kind of mission. We like to sort of bring ideas to life, create new things, and, um, and through a mixture of online and offline kind of activities, literally assembled what we have in here tonight. So it's really, really exciting. And I guess our community, we feel, was kind of mixed between kind of the people that make technology, right, and the people that use technology. And I think people in this room tonight is probably a very, very good example of that. I think we probably have, and that's kind of what all the colored landyards are about. We have the people, the developers, the designers, the creators, and then we have all the people that need all those tools. And it's only when you bring those two people together that you can actually really do anything meaningful. And, and thinking about community, uh, just wanna say a massive shout out to our sponsor, Setsat, uh, Durgan and Kate here at the front. They're sponsoring the pizzas tonight, so it's all on them. So thank you. Good work. And, um, and they're a fantastic local tech company doing all kinds of consultancy. If you were actually here in, was it November? Uh, Durgan did a, October. Durgan did a great talk about cybersecurity. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, speak to him because he's awesome. And, uh, and as a way of saying thank you for the pizza, um, we're just going to watch a one minute video that they've put together for us. So. And the audio doesn't work. Oh, it does. Yeah, nice one. Thanks, guys. That's really cool. So, if you want to be cool like Durgan and Kate, you could sponsor us as well. So, it's just a way of, I mean, this is not the only way to kind of contribute, add value, get involved. It's just one way um, to kind of keep the dream alive, keep the pizzas going, and uh, keep the events and everything else going. Um, so we just keep things very, very simple that if you're a business and you can afford it and you want to give us 200 pounds, 95% of that money goes on pizza and 5% goes on uh, meetup.com subscriptions. And, um, and we'd really, really appreciate it. Um, but like I said, it's not the only way to show support, so don't feel like it's something. I'm kidding, I want you all to do it. Um, <laughs> And in return, you know, we'll talk about you on social media. We have an email newsletter that goes out. We'll show you as much love as we can. And um, it's all, you know, a community thing. So, more shapes. So, there's, um, there's only really one update I want to talk about tonight because we've got a lot to get through. So, it's a really, really big update. And, um, and I'm just going to go back to this slide, actually, about our community and, um, and kind of looking at how we kind of find the balance and also provide opportunities on how we can maybe dig deeper. You know, we want to create, we want to innovate, we want to 
you know, really go sort of quite far on some subjects. So we're thinking about what could be done. So we started to sort of think about how we could focus on the people that make technology and perhaps the people interested in technology. So, well, yeah, I can feel it building. So, so today we're announcing another event that we're putting on. Uh, it's called DT Tech, and the kind of collective term is something called the Digital Taunton Fringe Events. And these are going to be events that we are going to be putting on on a regular basis, and it's going to provide um, a way in which people that have some, you know, uh, interest in some specific niches has the opportunity to dive into it, and um, and it's going to be an event that should really help um, the more technical people in the room, you know, really come together and, and kind of focus on that community, which is something that is desperately lacking, I think, around here, is that there is no real... Uh, vibrant tech meetup group for those that really want to dive into the technology, science, engineering, some of the stuff that probably wouldn't be appropriate for evenings like tonight. So to summarize this, um, this is a really, really exciting opportunity. It's actually being led by Sharon Lewis. So Sharon, just want to stand up and just make yourself known. So Sharon works at the hydrographic office and they've agreed to kind of partner with us on this. And, um, and what we're looking to do is, like I said, create these kind of deep dive events. We're going to, um, they're going to be on the, the second Wednesday of every month and it's going to be open to everyone. So it's not about the experts. It's, it's about, it's open to people maybe wanting to learn a little bit more. We want it to be as inclusive and as open as possible. So we are going to have a very similar format to this evening. There's going to be a couple of speakers. There's going to be um, a platform that we want to introduce to people that are perhaps new to speaking or don't feel like something like this would be perhaps their cup of tea. But they want to start making some steps in kind of, you know, developing that side of their, their skill set, right? So these events are going to allow you to come along and share some ideas or share some code or a project or something that's a bit more two-way with the audience as well. So we're really, really excited about this. It's going to be hosted here, um, and it's the the most important thing is the free pizza. Yeah, there's going to be free pizza. So, um, so we're really, really excited. So I hope that you guys will kind of embrace this, support it for those that you know feel like it's your your cup of tea. We've got two amazing speakers lined up already. So, Kieran, is it Kieran Evans? Kieran, Kieran Evans. He's actually here tonight somewhere. Kieran. Hey, so Kieran is a senior developer at the hydrographic office. From what I've been told by Sharon is that he's doing some crazy shit with maps and satellites and building all kinds of stuff with AI. And he's going to be doing this crazy talk about one of the projects they've been working on. And then the other speaker on that evening is a guy called John Jagger, and he is a consultant that works, travels the world working, on, working with some of the business, the, biz, the biggest the biggest businesses in tech. And, um, and he's all about test-driven development and best practices. So if that's kind of your thing, you know, sign up to this. Um, I think it's going to be really, really good. Um, if you're interested, I should have put Sharon's email on this as well. If you're interested in knowing a little bit more about this, if you're interested in speaking, if you're interested in sponsoring, um, you know, we, we need to build a team. We have a great team here and we need to build another team. So if you're interested in videography, photography, you want to help out with logistics or setting up, you know, I've been inundated over the last few months about people offering help. Uh, so maybe I'll start cashing on those emails. So you might, be, you might get an email from me tomorrow morning. Um, so um, if you're interested in that, drop us an email. The next event is going to be on Wednesday the 4th of March. So keep an eye on meetup.com over the next couple of days when that goes live and, um, and sign up. It's exactly the same process as what we have right now. There's a meetup account for this event and there'll be another meetup account for that one. And as I kind of mentioned, it's, uh, it's not replacing what we're doing right now. It's just another sort of uh, project that we're introducing and, um, and there could be a couple more in the pipeline as well. So um, keep your eyes peeled. Okay, that is actually enough of me, I think. So what we're going to do 
Um, next up is Mark from Somerset West and Taunton Council. Um, there's a really, really interesting project that he's going to be talking to us about. Um, so um, I'm going to let him explain it and bring him up here. Thank you. All right. Oh, no, you need that and that. Like, you, you told me this was the comedy club and you were the warm-up act. Oh. oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but post-Brexit, yes! Future now. Anyway, make me feel a little bit like Benjamin Button. Oh. I feel I'm starting all over again and I'm very nervous. You know? <laughs> what are you having a rave after where I got on? <laughs> they were upstairs in the club. Anyway, sorry. How do I make this uh, work? Um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I grew up before the computer. <laughs> the, so let's uh, just big button, the big, the big, the button. big one in the middle. Yeah. Right. So why am I here? Okay. Right. I've been in the private sector twenty years. I've been in the public sector seventeen years. But I've been in economic development. What's that? Well, it's Mark, public... talk into the mic. Sorry, it, it, it's the public sector equivalent. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> it's public sector equivalent of business development, right? Um, why am I in a local authority? Oh, I always wanted. I always dream of it. No. I, th uh, I thought it meant LA. I'm going to go to LA. Uh, no. I'm in the public sector because I love businesses. I love tech businesses. I've worked from Cambridge, East of England, right across Milton Keynes, right across the Oxford Corridor. I've come to Taunton, because I'm getting old and maybe redundant. No, no. But because actually Taunton, I like challenges. When people start slagging off places, I like underdogs, right? And in terms of Taunton, and what is it? What's its profile? Give me a blank. I don't do it. I facilitate it. And I build on the fantastic work of entrepreneurs and businesses. That's what makes my job interesting. So now I'm going to talk about the boring stuff. <laughs> um, so, government talks about housing. We're a garden town. Uh, you know, what does that mean? Lots of housing. No place can reinvent itself unless it has a soul. And what's the soul? The social, the networking, the talent, the people. So we're investing a lot of money in regenerating a site that's been doing nowhere for the last 10 years. For various reasons, you know, uh, um, you know, developers and whatever. So we are owning that as a council, and we are now, with the new leadership, taking it forward. Let me just say, uh, the interesting bit for yourselves is this commercial bit. So the railway station, Taunton, there, faster trains, and the innovation commercial zone, and what I'm going to talk about, a digital innovation centre, alongside what we hope, UKHO here, um, is a UKHO innovation centre. What we're trying to do is secure the last of the EU funded money to build an innovation centre, we'll get our money's worth before we leave properly. Um, and so we're putting an application in by March 2020, to some civil servants in London who are a little bit like Monty Python. You know, you remember that, those accountancy videos, sit behind the computer. Yeah, you must have demand for this, yeah? Check. So we got lots of challenging questions of guys who don't understand business like you do. And therefore, I need your help to actually put Taunton on the map to get demand the need for an innovation centre from all your networks, all your businesses, um, but also you guys to tell us what the modern version for what you want to do of innovation support should be. So call out to arms. We, we, these guys here at the front, you know, if any, uh, any of you guys are interested in you know, an hour's workshop at some stage in the next two weeks or whatever to tell us what you think would bring a building to life based on the ethos of Digital Taunton. So this is all going to be hopefully developed out in the next five years. Um, and if we get the money, uh, we'd know in summer, um, and we're looking to build and open this Digital Innovation Centre by 2022. Yeah, so, but in the meantime, we want to support Digital Taunton with any funding we can find, you know, to help develop your ideas and networks. Um, this is just a, a planning mastermind. But it's, basically what I'm saying is we're going to have a hotel. We've got a serious interest in a hotel. We were talking previously as a council about maybe we funded it. Actually, there's hotel interest now. You know, there's real vibrancy. There's a cinema chain. 
uh, that's really interesting we're talking to already. Uh, but we want some sexy restaurants. And what do you get with sexy restaurants? Se sexy people. Thank you. So it's up to you guys. Sorry, John, the pizza and a, and a, and a bit is fantastic. But we want, you know, afterwards as well, we want a, a, little, a little bit of something different, maybe caviar or, you know, something interesting to drink, cocktail, you know. John, get the cocktails on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, that's enough of that. Um, that's just a boring uh, sort of picture of buildings with no people. But there is going to be a green passageway between the railway station all the way through Coal Orchard, which, you know, we're developing now. Uh, you know, cycleways, greenways, you know, exhibition space, pom-pom dancing, you know, whatever. Digital Taunton, you know with your dog. <laughs> um, however, seriously, the economic impact of that whole site, and we, you know, we have, we're very professional about it, people that have actually put these sites away, would lead to 185 million investment, 3,000 construction jobs, a multiplier spend in the economy, nighttime economy. Um, on the site itself, in the offices, innovation, is 350 direct jobs and uh, for the council to spend for the benefit of businesses in future business rates taxes and household taxes of 4.3 million it's a massive economic impact for rejuvenating taunton um right this is a serious bit uh and and you guys will need to follow up with jeremy and shane on on on, on how we get the information we need so the county is putting 1.7 million capital in. We're leveraging about the same amount, if, if we're successful, to build the first phase of what we see as an innovation zone. It's not a building that's standalone in its own right. Um, 1,000 square meters squared. And, it, you know, what you've got here will complement, and what we do, you know, it's all about complementarity of options. This centre will uh, target digital. We, we've said digital because we know that UKHO is focusing on commercialization of maritime data. So we wanted to catch what digital taunt is doing and other opportunity areas, health tech perhaps, um, uh, clean tech, uh, you know, startup businesses from the college, etc. Um, funnily enough, I was talking to Barclays Bank who, who, who run uh, some uh, labs around the country and they're all focused on, I was at an event yesterday, on agri-tech that was held so massive opportunities um already we've been talking uh, with digital taunton and i've got a conversation with the chief operating officer of UKHO um next week exeter university the top guys at bridgewater and taunton college uh and mike about a strategic advisory board to help us get the business case in and then hopefully going forward, you know, being part of a big business partnership and include John in that digital um, Taunton uh, construct. Um, we want to complement what UKHO does and it is all about open innovation collaboration and what you guys are doing here. Um, so my final slide. So I'll, I'll be quick. So, uh, I, you know, we need you to help in the type of innovation services. This was just a, a sort of initial expression of interest of the sort of things. But uh, what we need to understand from yourselves is a bit more the customer journey of the types of support and innovation support, we, you know, you guys need um, and expand upon that. You know, you've already talked to Shane about some of the theme workshops, you know, so it's a bit more fleshing it out for government. Yeah. Um, and then the final thing is about demand and need. Um, so I was hoping this would be one of your, you know, uh, you know, let's vote now. Uh, we, we didn't have enough time to do that. So we <laughs> all right, we'll talk about that another day. Yeah, yeah. But let's have a show of hands. Would members of Digital Taunton welcome a digital innovation center on Firepool? Hold your hands up. Brilliant. Can you capture this on camera? We'll show government in real life technology streaming rather than we sent out these questionnaires and government said yes. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Would members see a future demand for a future startup centre in Taunton to support new businesses as well as graduates leaving university or college? Yes? Mm. <laughs> and finally, 
Um, would you welcome having innovation support services, which we would help co-fund for tenants as well as open innovation and collaboration for non-tenants? I think it speaks for itself. Yep. So I hand over back to the rave with uh, yourself, um, and it's goodbye from Ken Dodd. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. That was really good. I hope those civil servants in London don't have YouTube. Um, I'm just kidding. No, there's, it's really, really interesting. You know, there's a load of work going on over the next month about a proposal to build a purpose-built centre. Many, many other towns and cities have these kinds of places. Some of them are really successful. Some of them fail miserably. But there's a chance that Taunton might have one. And what would we do with it if we did have one? Really, really cool stuff. And, uh, and, and it's through this community and other things that are going on that it's even a possibility to put in the application. Um, so we're already making steps forward by just assembling in a, in a room like this once a month. So um, no, thanks, Mark. That was, um, that was good fun. Right. Up next. She's back. Um, so the multi-award winning, best-selling author, Kenda MacDonald. You can run away with that. Oh, oh, oh we've got to do the tech. I've got, I've got to do stuff. Hang on a sec. We've got to do the tech. I've got to do stuff. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. I want to breathe on the microphone and just sound like a total creeper the whole time. <laughs> just like heavy breathing. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not a good look on anyone. That's what I do. Yeah, that's what you do. <laughs> Total creeper. All right, everybody. Um, now, I'm going to be talking about attention, but I also want you guys to pay attention because I'm going to bribe you to pay attention. And I'm going to bribe you with what is arguably a little bit of a shit present because it's total self-promotion. But um, I'm going to bribe you with a copy of my book for the best question at the end of the session. So if you don't pay attention, you ain't going to be able to ask the question. And then you're going to be all losers. So um, definitely need to be paying attention. It's definitely the greatest way to start a talk is by insulting the entire audience. Um, so I'd love to talk to you guys a little bit about how attention actually happens. And so I'm going to be followed up by the amazing mommy blogger, um, who is going to talk to you a little bit about how you can actually utilize that and do some cool things on social media. But I wanted to show you guys how the brain actually works, some of the theories about attention and how you guys can utilize that to think a little bit differently about how you can get and keep attention when people are paying it. So. I'm Kenna MacDonald. Um, I am the founder of Automation Ninjas, and we specialize in behavioral marketing automation, which is quite a big mouthful. But basically, it's all about um, understanding your customers, understanding the behavior of your customers, and then creating journeys that they really want to be a part of. Because when you tap into that attention stream, you can get better quality customers, you can get better quality leads that convert better and stick around for longer, spending more money, which is what we all want, and they're happy while they're doing it. So you want to be able to make this process, and I want to teach you a little bit about how to actually start that process because if you don't have attention you ain't got nothing so if you follow me on twitter uh, you can send me photos of highland cows because that's my favorite thing ever and totally non-related to this talk so let's get started with some of the really heavy stuff because everyone wants to be really depressed in january right so let's get started with some of the problems that we're currently facing as businesses so this is my favorite part of the talk because i'm assuming majority british room right and I know everybody loves audience participation. And we're going to do some audience participation. And I'm just going to stand here really awkwardly until you guys actually do it. And then you'll feel really awkward. And someone will break. It will happen. Um, so I'm going to ask you some questions. And the first question is, what is it that consumers actually want? And I want three answers at least. Happiness. Happiness? Yeah. Attention. Attention. Yeah? Free stuff and value. Oh my God, so many value for money right here, just with all these questions. Simplicity. Simplicity, yeah, exactly. So what happens when you take all of these things and combine them together? What happens when you take value for money and attention and simplicity and free stuff and combine them together? You get, you get happiness, but you get the definition of consumer. 
And what consumers really want to do is consume. That's all they want to do. That's why we're called consumers. And when we consume, we want to do it in the way that we want to do it. We don't want to be told how to consume. And we have the means to do that now. We have the internet. We can change our services and our providers at the click of a button. All we want to do is we want to consume without being interrupted by anybody else. And we want to do it in the way that we want to do it. And we are empowered to do that now. But what is it that businesses want? Yeah, we want money. We want to sell our shit. That's what we want to do. And we're going to do that in the best way possible. So most of the time, that means we're going to interrupt our consumers, we're going to steal their data, and we're going to do everything that we can to get in front of people, right? That's what businesses do. That's certainly what consumers think businesses do, and do they have it wrong? If you look at some of the biggest businesses in the world, they don't have it wrong at all. So what's happening is we're fueling something that's called the divide. And it's the divide between what consumers want and what businesses need to do to get by. And as we sit here and go, how are we going to get more likes on Facebook? How are we going to get our ads in front of the right people? How are we going to do this? How are we going to track people's behavior? People like me, people who do that for a living, are fueling the divide between consumers and we're making everybody really, really unhappy in the process. So we've got to fix some of that. So does this ultimately mean that it's all doom and gloom? Well, Actually, it's not a very good picture. I'm not going to sugar it for you guys, but we're basically fucked, right? Okay, that's, that's where we're standing at. Um, because for the first time ever, in 2019, we saw a global decline in page views. And that means that people stopped looking at websites as much as they were previously. Now, that doesn't mean that people stopped consuming. Actually, people consumed a lot more we're just really impatient with how we consume. So we spend less time on websites and we look at less website pages. You might think that's not really a bad thing, but it is a really bad thing. And it does come with a really nice thing, though, because it was actually an increase in conversion rates because we're happier to do stuff online. We trust people. We will spend our money online because you know, we can get it back if something goes really wrong. We're quite happy to buy things on Amazon. We're happy to give away our email address. Even though we feel funny about our data, we're quite happy to sign up for lead magnets and all sorts of stuff. So we're getting really comfortable interacting with businesses online, but there's a really big but in this, because in order to get a conversion, you have to get someone to spend 16% longer on a website. So while we're happy to do stuff online, and we have to stick around for longer to get that conversion, we aren't doing that. So we aren't spending as much time before. So we don't have as much attention as we used to. So we've got to do really good things with that attention. Or maybe, instead of trying to put some tactics and some strategies in place, maybe we just need to understand what people want to pay attention to. And if we understand that, we can provide the things that consumers actually want. And to get started, you have to know how attention works. And so to do that, we can start bridging that divide. So we're going to need to go into, into the why behind things. And that's what I want to do. So in the beginning, there was attention, because without attention, there's nothing else. Don't trust what the Bible says to you about in the beginning, there being light. It's attention, right? OK, so when you start off with attention, and you start looking at the theories behind attention, we come to the lovely Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Any psychology nerds in the room? Thinking fast and slow? Yeah, one. Wow, I'm disappointed in you guys. Come on, you should have been reading up before you came in here. So these guys were super inventive, and uh, they said, we have two different systems for paying attention. Run away very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> he did it as well, it was great, I have the power. Yeah. Um, so he said, we have two different systems for paying attention, these guys. And because they were super, super inventive, they called them system one and two. Um, and they basically said, you know, the difference between these systems is that the one system is really, really fast. And because it's really fast, um, it's basically automatic. The other system is really, really slow. Um, and because it's slow, it's really manual. And so they said, well, this is the automatic system. This is the manual system. It's really, really inventive, isn't it? These guys were on it. Um, and they like to refer to system one as being being autopilot and system two is being the pilot. Now I make fun of their inventiveness, but actually this is our best theory of attention. It's been supported by lots of data over the last 30 years since they came up with this. Um, and they basically said, you know, this explains a lot of the weird stuff that we do. So brains do really weird shit all day long. So does everybody know how to drive? Yeah, majority of the room. Um, or at least learning how to drive for the younger ones. I'm not sure how young we are in this room. Um, so 
when I learned how to drive, it was an entirely terrifying experience and I hated it. <laughs> it was awful. Um, I remember getting in the car and um, I learned how to drive in a Land Rover Defender and it's the best car in the world. No one can argue with that. Um, and I was just puttering along a track on the side of a mountain, terrified of falling off the edge. My grandfather was like, no, this is great. It's going to teach you lane guidance. And I'm like, oh my God, I can drive off the edge of the mountain. And um, it was just really confusing, the whole thing, because you've got to do things with your feet. And I'm really badly coordinated at the best of times. You've got to coordinate your feet, you've got to coordinate your hands, and you've got to do all the gear stuff, and that's really complicated. And then he went, okay, we've got to the end, we haven't died, you're ready to go out on the road with cars. And I was like, no, I'm not. And then when we went out on the road with cars, I realized something else. I've got to look up. I have to look at the cars. I have to figure out what's going on here. I can't look at my hands. I can't look at my feet. And I got so frustrated. And I got back in the car with my grandmother the next day, who is a terrible driver and swears a lot and gets really angry at people. And I looked at her and I'm like, how is she doing it? How is she doing this so easily? And I am struggling to learn how to do it. Fast forward. Um, a couple of years, I get in the car now and sometimes I end up at the shops and I have no idea how I got there. And I'm like, I've been driving a two-ton death machine and I don't remember driving here at all. That's terrifying. But it will often happen and for some of us, we'll drive to the wrong location automatically. And basically, this is the two different systems. When you are learning how to drive, you are using system two. And eventually, when you learn how to drive, you've put habits in place. When you put those habits in place, you're using system one. And the real difference between the two systems is that system one can take in 11 million bits of information per second. That's a lot of data, okay? A lot of data very, very quickly. Whereas system two can only take in 40 bits of information per second. So when you're learning how to drive, you're using that system and your brain is struggling. And your brain hates using that system. Because when your brain uses that system, it uses calories. And when you're using calories, that means you don't have enough to get away from the lions that are prowling around everywhere. So every time, you use system two, your brain tries to make you use system one. And it's this constant go back between the two. And when you learn a habit, you put something called a rule or a mental shortcut in place. So your brain doesn't have to use lots of calories. And it's all great and it's lovely. But when you're using system two, it's intensive and effortful and you're really, really tired afterwards. So I hope everyone's going to be really tired after this talk because you're going to be paying lots of attention. But it gets really boring talking about system one and system two. So I thought we'd break it down, make it a bit more exciting. So system one is basically the minions, right? And system two is Gru. Has everyone, has everyone seen the minions or a version thereof? Right? No. What are you even doing here? <laughs> that's your homework. Go home and watch that. Okay, that's it. You're going to go back and you'll be like, I learned great things tonight. Um, so the main premise of this movie is that Gru's like this amazing criminal overlord and he's doing a great job and he has all these dastardly plans and he can't do everything by himself. And because he can't do everything by himself, he either employs or enslaves this little race of yellow people. I'm not entirely sure what kind of message we're trying to send to kids, but basically he has this, this group of people that do all of this stuff for him. And it's all great, except for the fact that the minions can only do one thing. They're not very bright, so one minion can do one job. And the, the whole premise of the movie is them just fucking shit up the whole time. Like them just like coming across something and not being able to handle it and just exploding stuff. Um, and it kind of works out okay for Gru though because he has thousands of minions. He doesn't just have five all doing one job. He has thousands of them all doing lots of different jobs um, and totally destroying stuff all the time. But the great thing is this is precisely how our brain works, pretty much. So we have this one dude who can only do so much. He can only take in so much information. And then we have all these minions running about the place, taking in the rest of the information. And this works fine, except for the fact that when we create our marketing materials and when we try and talk to our consumers, we think that our consumers are in groom mode, these super cognitive beings. We love to think of the fact that we are these very clever, very sort of present, almost omnipresent beings in our brains. We like to think that. But in reality, you only spend 15% of your day in Gru mode or in system two. The other 85% of your day you're spending in minion mode. Right? So when you're creating materials for your consumers, you have to get past the gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper is the minions. 
If you don't get past those guys, you're not going to get to Gru. Because the brain does not want to use Gru because it uses precious calories. Now, I wish my brain used a bit more calories. I wouldn't mind. And I'm sure most people wouldn't mind if that was the case. But unfortunately, we've got the minions to thank for making our lives a little bit easier. So we know what to pay attention to. And our brain decides that well before we actually think we're paying attention to something. So I did a little experiment on myself. Um, I didn't do it on my husband this time. It's great living with a psychologist because we're always doing experiments. Um, and I searched for the best zombie movies. I used some eye tracking software to figure out what I was actually looking at. So I was trying to replicate another experiment without kind of like ruining their data. So I did my own. So I searched for best zombie movies and I wanted to see what am I actively paying attention to in the search result. And just to zoom in a little bit, there's a couple of things that Google has tried to do to make my life really easy. So it's put all of the titles up at the top of some of the best movies, but I don't know what ranking system they've used for this. And what was really interesting is that my eyes didn't look at that at all. I skimmed straight past it. So the first thing that my eyes settled on was this link, the 45 best zombie movies from IMDb. That was the first thing I had to look at, but I didn't click on it. The second thing I had to look at was the 10 best zombie movies of all time by Screen Rant. Now, if you're into any kind of alternative movies or slightly different stuff off the beaten track, then Screen Rant is generally the place that you go to for information. Except for the fact that Screen Rants have become bastards and they've put stuff on individual pages so you have to click through, like really clickbaity, and I hate that. It's a waste of my precious 50 seconds. So I don't go to Screen Rant. I ended up clicking on the IMDb link instead. And what that was really interesting was, why did I do that? Why did I ignore all of these other guys? That sounds great. That one's, that's Time Out. Paste Magazine. Don't know who that is. There's even a YouTube video on that. I just ignored all of it. I literally only looked at those two pieces of information on the page. And that's because I trust and I've made a rule set for IMDb. Because it is crowdsourced and everybody else is putting their reviews on there, I trust that my peers are giving me the right information. So the minions go, we know IMDb, we trust the source, and I ignored everything else, I filtered it all out. What was particularly interesting is that I also knew what not to pay attention to, or at least my minions did anyway. Because I found something on this page. Um, and it's definitely the source that most people would go to to get the best information on all things alternative. And I ended up going and I just wanted to see what did I ignore. And I ignored this one, which is such a shame because I definitely would have got the information from there. It's the 13 best zombie movies from none other than the Cosmopolitan magazine. <laughs> that, you know, that resource for good movie information. Um, and the other thing I ignored was, was the second page of Google, because I found what I wanted on the first page. Um, I didn't even go there. So your consumers are in minion mode all of the time. And if they're in minion mode, that just means that most of the time they're ignoring what you're doing. If you're trying to talk to Gru, you need to talk to the minions instead. And you need to find little hacks and little systems that you can put in place in order to get people to pay attention to you instead. So let's take a look at some real life brain stuff. So the first thing that you can do as businesses is you can really, really nail framing. So framing is really important to us. And are we ready for a little bit more audience participation? Yeah. So all you have to do is scream left or right. That's it. You have to, I'm going to show you a picture. I want to know which little square in the middle is darker, which is the darker gray. Okay? And you're just going to scream left or right. Don't think about it too much. Which one is it? No, no. The square in the middle, guys. Yeah, right. Correct. No one listens to instructions. You're not paying attention. The whole talk is about attention. Right. So... Basically, it's this square here. The square in the middle is darker. Now, when we put people in various different things to have a look at how we perceive color, most people perceive color in different wavelengths. So you can see in the brain with different wavelengths what the color is that they're perceiving. And we can see that people perceive this square on the inside as darker. But using my amazing copy and paste skills, they are exactly the same color. No difference between the two whatsoever. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. I'm giving it all away. Um, so our brain is literally using the frame that is around the squares to dictate what's inside the square. And in reality, it's exactly the same color. So we can utilize this to our advantage because there is a frame put around absolutely everything that we do and we can control that frame. So you either control the frame or you let external resources control the frame for you. There, are, there is no other option. 
So the economist is actually a really good example of this in real life in a more um, sort of tactical way. So the economist has a great pricing structure and they had the economist.com as a subscription for $59, the print subscription for $125 and the print and web subscription for $125. Now I'm not a math genius, but I'm pretty sure that 125 plus 59 is not 125. So immediately we know that that's a really good deal. So what was really interesting is when you looked at the conversion rates on the pages for this. So the economist.com subscription converted at, at around 16%. The print, the, just the print subscription by itself, full 0%. No one is buying that. And the rest of the people, 84% of the people are buying the print and web subscription, even though it's the more expensive option. Why are we doing that? Well, uh, because our brain said that's a great deal, even though maybe it isn't. Um, and so the user experience designers and all in all their great knowledge said we're going to get rid of this one that's zero percent no one's doing anything with that it's a useless non-converter eliminate it so this is what we end up with right and uh, fascinating what happened profits plummeted 68 percent of people now went to the 59 dollar option and 32 percent to the to the 125 dollar option okay so there is an effect called coherent arbitrariness this is a bias that we have and just using that coherent arbitrariness gave the economist a 43 percent boost in their profits as a result and so what coherent arbitrariness is is it's a framing bias we take an arbitrary thing and we create a baseline which we assume is true and we coherently do it all the time. So you can either put no baseline in place or you can put a baseline in place and see what happens. Um, so there's little things that we can be doing to help people make decisions, but we need to use our superpowers for good. Um, so one of the ways that, that we can do this as well is by looking at the signals that we are giving people. Because every time we give someone a piece of information, we're giving them certain types of signals. You either give people implicit signals or you give people explicit signals. So implicit signals is everything that you imply. It's the way you look. It's, um, you know, like rockers like to wear certain pieces of clothing. Heavy metalers like to wear certain pieces of clothing. Very professional people like to wear sparkly shoes, right? We all have our signals that we're giving out. These are implied signals that we're telling people. I don't have the word sparkly shoed idiot tattooed on my forehead, but people can see that straight away. So the explicit signals are the things that are very clearly labeled as such. So implicit signals are understood by the minions. That's what they, that's what they live on. If you tell somebody, Think of something round, think of something that's round and green, and think of something that's round and green and has a stalk, most people start thinking along the lines of apples or some kind of fruit that is round and green and has a stalk. And the more you do that, the more tests you go into, you realize that you don't have to give people very much information at all before they draw their own conclusions. The explicit signals are controlled by group. And the explicit signals might be something like the word apple or a sentence that is describing an apple. But the implicit signals are the first thing that we understand. And if you can get the implicit signals right, you get past the gatekeepers who will then allow you to pay attention and use that calorie consuming part of your brain. So I want to show you an example of somebody doing this really well. It's my favorite example of people being really silly. Um, so Adidas, I'm going to get really sexist now, okay? So if you're going to get offended, I'm just giving you a pre-trigger warning, but we're all going to get super sexist. And, and you know, I'm qualified, it's fine. I'm allowed to be sexist, it's okay. Um, so Adidas came up with a new shower gel called a Dynamic Pulse Shower Gel. Great name for shower gel, right? And they had to get into the marketplace and their target audience was the manly man. One of the hardest target audiences to convert to everything. Here we go, manly man. You might not wanna, <laughs> you might not wanna be part of this example. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, just gonna warn you, you might not. I'm gonna get really insulting right now. <laughs> so let's not be part of it. So the whole deal with the manly man is that he is extremely loyal. So the manly man decides on something and he will buy that thing for the rest of his life and he ain't gonna change it. And when Adidas went to market with Dynamic Pulse Shower Gel, it was Imperial Leather that was the top shower gel out there because basically you can use it, you don't have to put your perfumey stuff on, your manly perfumey stuff, don't have to go on because you smell nice, right? So the manly man doesn't go into the supermarket, look at this, all the different bottles of shampoo and shower gel, sniff them and read the back. He's not doing that. 
he stomps into the supermarket, throws it in his trolley and stomps back out again to go play with something else, right? The manly man isn't faffing around watching loads of adverts and paying attention to stuff on TV. So how do you change what the manly man showers with? Well, you get really clever. You find out what the manly man holds really dear. And when you find out what he holds really dear, you make your product look like that thing. And so they figured that the thing that the manly man really, really holds dear was castor oil motor oil. <laughs> yeah? And uh, it worked. It actually worked. They managed to knock um, imperial leather off. Now, what they did to actually make it really be like the motor oil, so they chose the color. No one else was using different colored bottles at that point. They put this grip on the side. It has this super grip, which is the same as the grip that's on the side here. So when you hold it, it feels the same. And what the, probably the best bit was the feedback that they had when you open the cap. When you open the cap, it makes the same click as an oil bottle makes when you open the cap of it. So clever. And it worked. It, like, it actually worked as well. You look at this stuff and you think, you psychologists are a bunch of wankers. And it's true. <laughs> it's true. We are. But then something really bad happened because Castrol changed its branding. It's all right, we changed ours too. It's totally fine. It's totally fine. So what they did really cleverly was they controlled all the implicit signals. And by doing that, the minions were super happy, right? Because you've controlled all the variables. Everything matches. It's something we love. And we've just decided, yes, we're quite happy with that. And that's going to be our purchase. And what was the explicit signal here? It was the name Dynamic Pulse, which means fuck all, right? What does Dynamic Pulse even mean? Might mean something to do with cars. I don't know. I'm not a manly man. But all the implicit signals were in the right place, and it worked really, really well. And the other thing that we can do is we can control for cognitive effort. Because once you've got attention, you want to keep the attention. So if you're using your implicit signals and you're framing really well and you've got that attention, don't waste it by making people's lives really hard. The brain doesn't want to use calories. Don't make it use calories. So here's a little thing that we're going to play, right? No. I'm not decided, I think I'm going to ban Jeremy from this. I'm going to ban anyone who is colorblind, I'm really sorry, you can't play. And anyone who is dyslexic, I'm also sorry, you can't play because you have an unfair advantage. Um, so we're not, you guys aren't allowed to play the game, but everyone else can play. I'm totally a dictator. Um, so the idea is, with the Stroop test, is it causes the two parts of your brain to fight, like a really hardcore fight. Um, and it's an evil bastard of a test, because generally when you do a test, it gets easier as you go along. This test gets harder the more you do it. And it's because it makes the two systems fight. So the idea behind the test is that you say the color, don't read the word. Okay, so you've got to say the color out loud, and we're going to do the first line together. Okay, everyone's practicing already. That's not allowed. That's not allowed. Okay, so the first one is green, then purple or pink. That's fine. Then yellow. That one's evil, and then red, right? And then the further on you go, the more likely you are to screw up. And the reason this happens is because when you start out, you start out in system two, you start out as Gru, and everything's great because you're paying very close attention. The further on you go, the minions go, hey, you're using calories. We don't like that. We don't want that. We've got to save them for the lions. We've got to run away from shit. Um, so they go, it's OK, we can help. We can help. And so the minions take over. But when the minions take over, they read the word, because that's the rule set we've got in place. And when they read the word, you trip up, and you've lost. So then system two takes over, and Gru goes, no, no, stop it. You're messing everything up. And it takes over again. And then you start using more calories. And the brain goes, no. No, we can do this, we can read. And it starts the process all over again. And so you constantly trip up, and the more you do it, the harder the entire test gets, and the more mistakes you make because your brain is getting fatigued. Now, when you are putting really difficult to consume things on your website and your marketing materials, that's what you're doing to your consumers. It makes it really hard for them to pay attention. And when the minions are confused or your brain is fatigued, only one of two things is going to happen. The information is going to get ignored and deleted because it's taking up cognitive space. We don't want to make things really, really hard. And if you really want to mess with your friends and you really like swearing, not sponsored by the way, there's this game that I got bought, uh, that was bought for me for Christmas. It's a great game. It has lots of really bad swear words in it, so you have to like swearing. Um, and it basically, it's a drinking game, and every time you make a mistake, you have to take a drink, and it's hilarious. Um, and it just gets worse the further along you go. So 
what's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? And as some of you, no, it's not lies. It's this says in brackets, it's not what you do. Um, it's flowcharts. Yeah? Yeah. Aren't flowcharts lovely? Um, all joking aside, though, it is flowcharts. But more, it is a behavioral structure for designing experiences. Because when you sit down and you give yourself space to properly design an experience, you start to think about these things. You start to think about, OK, all right. We've got to pay attention to this. How do we help people understand this? Is this a little bit too hard? Give yourself the time and the space to sit down and design your experience, and you start to give yourself the opportunity to be behavioral and to help people pay attention. So if you want to hack brains, it's really simple. Ease cognitive demand. Make it easy for people to understand stuff. Frame really well and build your consumers a journey to go on. Give them the next step all the time. People like to know where they're going. So what you're going to go off and do is your homework. We like giving people homework. First thing is I want you to go have a look at your materials. Go have a look at the stuff that you're doing. Are you controlling the frame? Because if you're not controlling it, someone else is. And it's more than likely the minions. And that's a bad time. So control the frame really, really well. Is it cognitively demanding? This is probably the worst thing I see people do. Is it difficult to consume your materials? Can the minions understand it? What's implicit in your materials? Like, who are you trying to look like? How are you trying to corral all of that stuff together? And what's explicit? So what's really obvious for people? And is it the right message that you're wanting to get across the group? Because you have a very short space of time to use that attention. And most of all, is it minion friendly? If I can give you one piece of advice, it's just to think of your consumers as minions. Don't call them that to their face. But you know, just kind of make sure that everything's easy, simple, and you'll have an efficient and effective marketing process. Now, if you want a little bit more on this, I strongly suggest that you be like Ross and go get yourself a copy of the book. Um, you can get it at that link, but it goes into a little bit more of the tactical stuff as to how you can all use all of the stuff and a little bit more into the neuroscience behind it, because we all love a bit of neuroscience, right? Um, so that's me, guys. Thank you very much. So, so good. Any questions at all for Kenda? No. When are the questions for the book? Now, do it now. I'm a little bit ahead of time. We're good. You've got, you're good for time. Go on. On the Stroop test. Yes. Bottom row. Yes. Furthest left. What yeah. colour was the word purple? <laughs> not single purple. No, that's <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. It's your job. <laughs> it's your job to pay attention, not mine. What was it, though? Yellow. Oh. Oh! Oh no! Oh no! Oh, I can't answer that oh, question. Next question. Oh, go on, yeah. Oh, oh, oh no, he's handing microphones oh, out. This one here. I didn't get to choose. We need the microphone for the live stream. Oh. Have you ever employed your two tests to image based content? So, almost having the minions opening a video and, and that, that fight between. Grew in the millions to deliver a good product video or, or an image. Mm. So, do you mean have I actually tested this or have yeah. I thought about using the minions? Because I will get into a lot of does, trouble. Does it, does it work? If I use the minions. Yes, does it, work it does in, work. As an image based format yeah. video. Yes, it works. Um, you know, on YouTube ads, when they have the pre scroll, it works really well in that. If you can get attention within a certain amount of time. So you basically have two ways that you can go about getting attention. You either have to be so exciting, so different, that the minions freak out and don't know what to do about it. But then you also have to be important, so they pass it up to Gru. So you either have to do that, which is really difficult to do, and you you have to be the first person to do that. Because the second they learn that you're just trying to grab their attention, that's it, it's game over. Or you have to be really, really good and be something that they're actually interested in. So you're much better off trying to find the right consumer and give them the right information, and then you can... But they've, they've tested that on pre-scroll ads. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's right. Oh. Go on. Next one. Go on. Oh, goodness. Um, I'm actually trying to read Thinking Fast and Slow oh, at the yeah. moment. Oh, yeah, difficult. How do I get my brain to concentrate on? <laughs> yeah, just think of it as minions. I don't know, it's really... Um, I've read that book several times because it was a, a lot of the base research for that. Um, I also went and I read their individual studies, which are even harder to read. It's my big problem with the psychology industry. It's full of psychobabble. And it's one of the things I tried to really step away of, just be 
nice and normal, like a normal person. Um, it is really difficult, but what I would suggest is there are a lot of people like me when I was studying who created summaries of the book to help them studying, and that that might be a better way to consume the information because they haven't written it in an accessible way. And they've mixed loads of stats in with it. So if you don't like stats, yeah. you know, you're definitely going to switch off. But yeah, try and find a summary that's a little bit more human. <laughs> Dagan? Kendra, um, with the, the Economist example, which oh, is yeah. brilliant, um, is there any evidence to suggest that the price of the second two, i.e. Mm -hmm. print and then print and web, why were they the same price rather than logic suggests that perhaps the web and print, if it were 5% more, yeah. would, the, would the percentages be greater? If you have a look at The Economist, um, the UK version, it isn't the same price for the two of them. And it still works just as well. Um, but I don't think that there was any logic behind it, because otherwise they wouldn't have taken the non-converter out and lost all that money for about six months as for, for what they tested it for. So it was a lot of money that they lost. So I don't think they would have done it. It's just one of the most famous examples. But it's immediately obvious with that that it's a good deal. Because your brain goes, wait wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. I, I, I got tweeted something recently with someone, if you want to tweet me like weird stuff that marketers do, please, by all means do, I love that shit. Um, I got, saw something really cool that Amazon did. So Amazon had a deal price, and then you could select an option for the normal price. Like, why would you select the option for the normal price? And somebody just tweeted out about it, being like, this doesn't make any sense, Amazon, why would you do that? Actually, it makes perfect sense. Because what Amazon is reminding you is that that's what the normal price is, and you're getting the deal price. No one's going to select it, but Amazon is just reminding you that you're getting a good deal. So I get really annoyed when I see people offer a discount price, and they don't have the crossed out amount next to it. We need to know what the baseline is, and you need to control all that frames. So if you're giving someone a deal, show them how much of a deal you're giving them. It makes it makes it much easier for us to understand. Mm. Right, I'm working around the room. Yeah. Patrick. You get the microphone now. I'm glad you're not a manly man because, you know, <laughs> sorry to all the manly men, super sexist. I am a manly oh, man. <laughs> Right. I was gonna sorry. <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna ask if it did smell of oil, but um my question was actually exactly almost the same question. It was like when you showed the second one, mm. you actually said there was a forty three percent drop when they took it out. Yeah. It sorry, increase actually. No, no, it said increase. I meant on that the, it was a four yeah. inherent arbitrariness gave it a forty three percent boost. By having that that useless non converter, yeah, it yeah. was forty three percent more profitable. That absolutely makes sense. Yeah. And I don't know why they call themselves the economist either because they should have known. I don't think the UX designers were economists. It's, it's the most famous example of a very costly mistake. Okay. Well, since I don't have my question anymore, my one question is, can you sing? Um, no. Oh, because I want to say happy birthday to, to you. To Shane. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to Shane. Shane. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, dear Shane. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. I'm faster than everyone else. going to be great for the live stream guys who can only hear me singing. <laughs> it's going to be really nice for them. Uh, yeah. uh, Happy birthday. Good job. Good job. Hi. Um, Hi. I just want to know what the number one zombie film was. Oh. And if you get it wrong, I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> um, 28 weeks later is not a zombie film. That's why it's not it was number three. Sorry. Mm. My number one is actually, disappointingly, Shaun of the Dead. Ah. Yes. <laughs> See, I love it because it was funny, um, and my little brother can watch it with me, he's only six. So that's currently my favorite. Um, but even though it is a virus, and very disputed, 28 Days Later is my second favorite. Have you seen Train to Busan? No, what is this? It's a Korean one, it's really good. Oh, The Train, yeah. yes, yes, I have seen that. It was really cool. Yeah, but I didn't, they could do less CGI. Were you not in a zombie film, though? No, I'm too short for that one. Aww. Aww. So you're not manly man enough. You should have used some Adidas, Adidas Dynamic Pulse. You'll be fine. Oh, there we go. Oh, there's a reaching for the microphone behind you. Hi, sorry, nothing about zombie films. Oh. Um, there used to be a statistic about attention and mm. about the amount of time it was and how it's shortened now, and because our brains are changing so that 
we're just not yeah. taking attention anymore. Um, what is the time now that you can hold someone's attention for? The, the statistic. The statistic is basically bullshit. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, they cannot... As it, they are. It's as, they, as most of them are. The things that you've got to look for with statistics is whether it's, it's actually relevant, so whether it's, it's more than, than chance. Um, and most of these, because they're just surveys and stuff, aren't, aren't any more than chance, so that there isn't any statistical validation behind any of them. However, we do know how long... It's in the book. There's actually some stuff in the book. We do know how long it takes for system one to pay attention, so for the minions to pay attention and decide whether or not they like certain materials. And it's less than a second for most of them. So it's not enough information. The, the thing we can take away from those studies is the fact that we don't actually look at something for enough time to take any of the information away before we decide whether or not we're going to trust it. So those implicit signals are so powerful that we make the decision well before we've consumed the content. So if you're not aligning the two things up, you're really shooting yourself in the foot. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Excellent. Oh. oh, some in the middle. Could we pass the mic down? Thanks. Um, does it matter for your attention on what medium you consume? So whether you're looking at a yeah. small phone screen? Definitely. Or, okay. So one of the worst things that we can do is um, advertise badly um, because we waste a lot of our money. So sometimes you'll see people advertising like maybe B2B services like a piece of tech or a piece of software on Facebook in the evening. So you've got to think about what the mode the person is in and that really you know, when we're looking for something really actively, we'll pay attention to things. Otherwise, the minions are going, not relevant, not relevant, not relevant. And if we're scrolling along on social media and we're trying to wind down, we're not going to go look at some tech tool that's going to show you how to do something. But when we're maybe on LinkedIn during the day and we're very actively thinking about work, that might trigger up the attention. So you do really need to think about what medium is somebody on and why are they on that medium as to whether or not they're going to pay attention. But there's definitely a difference between video content and um, like blog textual content, which is why I prefer blog, uh, blog textual content over video. So it does, it does affect the way that you pay attention to stuff. You tend to take in more when you read stuff because you're using more parts of your brain to understand reading. Yeah. Are the System 1 minions sort of a generic... <laughs> Um, what's the way I'm trying to say this? Are they the same demographic? Do they all behave the same way? Or no. do, are there different groups of yes. Indian? It's massively cultural. Okay. So you have massive cultural differentiations. There's, um, oh, there's a really great book. I'll send you the link to it. It's got one part in it, the rest of it's rubbish, but I'm the kind of person who will buy something for one page in a book if, it, if it's going to help me get, get somewhere. And it's got a really great section which basically goes through what different cultures hold in high regard. And that means that their minions are going to interact differently. Demographically speaking, because different things are important to different demographics, it means we're going to pay attention to things differently. So, for instance, younger generations are much more, uh, in the teenage years, are much more obsessed about how something looks, whereas older generations don't really care about it. So it, they, you really do have a play with demographics and psychographics. So you've got to think like the right type of minion. Right. Yeah, cool. which is why just target your audience really, really clearly. And if you can be super targeted on your audience, you'll be able to provide the stuff that they're interested in and forget the rest. Yeah. Where'd you get your shoes? Oh. <laughs> oh um, this, this is actually going to excite FitFlop very much, but <gasps> FitFlop sponsored Fit FitFlops, and they sponsored all of the Brighton SEO speakers, so I got them for free. I just love flip <laughs> while they're happening. Aren't I'm they great? Some. I don't think I'm <laughs> ever going to buy any other shoes as well because they're super comfy. They're great. Is that all good? Oh, one, one more. Two more. Oh, two more. Three more. Well. You just cut me off whenever you like. <laughs> um, so I tend to just skip past the sponsored links when I'm doing any Google mm. searches, just a inherent yeah. behaviour. Do we find that as the sort of the dark arts of the web are greater understood that more people are skipping past those links? Or are they still quite an effective method of, of advertising? Well, I have a very strongly held opinion on uh, sponsored links not being very good. Um, so please don't kill me if you're in advertising. <laughs> no, um, <I'm> not. <laughs> 
you've got to think about what the intent is behind what someone is trying to do. And very often you'll find if it, if it is really exciting, people will click on it. But you've got to think about how they're going to go into that page when they're doing it. So they go with their guard up. So you've got a lot more work to do when you're bringing someone through from an ad to bring that guard back down again and get them trusting you. You have, um, so we've done many studies with loads of our clients who just completed an 18 month study on customer lifetime value and the different types of traffic that um, contribute to that and organic traffic by far wins everything else. So organic traffic brings in consistent customer lifetime value over um, social media spend um, and Google click traffic. That's not to say that those things don't have their place. It's just that if you're looking at pure data, that's the one that's, that's winning. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Kenda. While we're walking Ready over, I've uh, just got um, a couple of questions on the live stream. Oh, yes. So we've got someone asking, thinking about written content, mm. would it be good to start with minion content to attract attention before moving on to being more sophisticated where Guru yes. gets involved? Yes, 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 yes. So you definitely want to have the stuff that captures the attention of people and then you want to take them a little bit deeper. So we call this daisy chaining content. So you bring someone in for a certain piece of content and then you transition them onto something else. So this is particularly prevalent in industries where someone thinks that they want something, but actually they need something entirely different. Um, so you might need to kind of teach people a little bit about something with some basic content that is, you know, created for succulence and excitement and then transition them onto some more advanced content when they realize that you actually know what you're talking about. Trying to go straight for the advanced content is only going to capture a really small pool of people. So you're definitely better off going with some basic, exciting, succulent stuff and then hitting them with the hard truths afterwards. Awesome. And then one more. Um, Paul on the live stream says, how important are visuals in swaying decision uh, compared to text alone? Very important. Um, however, <laughs> and throw a caveat in there, I would say that the vast majority of the time, yes, very important. We are starting to pay attention to meme type information like we pay attention to videos. Um, sorry, like we pay attention to visuals. So when we see um, little bits of text as a meme, um, we have a different reaction to something that is like that, something that lots of people are sharing on social media. So, you know, when you see like someone's like screenshotted a tweet or something, and it's really funny and people are sharing that, we are now interacting with that text-based visual in the same way that we're interacting with visuals. So the way that we're interacting with stuff is changing as well. So it's just a real clusterfuck working in psychology because, you know, the brain's just don't stop. They just do stuff all the time and they change everything that they're doing. But yeah, we're, we are adapting the way that we, that we interact with things, but definitely visuals are really important. And it's especially important to stay ahead of the trends with visuals because the second it starts looking like everything else, you need to change it up again. Brilliant. And I think we need to wrap it there, I'm afraid. Oh, just uh, last one, last it's one. It's all right, thanks. Do it. I've been <laughs> holding it politely. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, I feel like my thunder may have been stolen by one of the previous questions, oh. but it was really a case of, um, I wanted to gauge your opinion on whether um, impact, like big image or big video impact marketing was better or whether it was a consistent marketing campaign that would work better in the long run? Uh, consistency always wins with the minions because you're creating a positive rule set. So you might need to start with impact and then move on to something that's a bit more consistent. Trickle, the, a trickle effect. The reason I went for IMDB is because I trust it long term um, and, and pretty much nothing else. So if you can have a trickle effect and you can put that rule set in place, then you're winning. It's all about the rules. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Oh, I got to choose. I have Best to question. I have to choose a question. I can't remember any of them. <laughs> do you know what? My favorite question was a live stream question, and I don't even know how that works. Oh, I do, because I know her. It was Becky from ADPR. Oh. So, oh, and uh, well, we're assuming it was oh, Paul. Which one? The one about image and tech? The first one. Yeah. The first one. one. The first one, yeah. No, she don't. Yeah, I don't want to give it away. But it, ADPR can have it. But the thing is, I Be think I think Becky has one already. <laughs> right. Well, we'll run it past Becky and run maybe it past we can... Becky, and then um, if it's not Becky, it's going to be... Oh, 
Oh, I really like the zombie. What about a zombie question? guy? I'm going for yeah, zombie I'll guy. Yeah, I'll go zombie not guy. Not Becky. I'm sorry for everyone else the clever questions. Will now forever be known as zombie guy. Mm. Sorry. What? Right, guys, that was. Ah, that was amazing. Like, thank you, Kenda. I knew it would be. Um, so, guys, uh, we're going to have like a 10 minute break now. So, hopefully, there's going to be plenty that need it. Um, company do lots of beers, coffees, cakes, biscuits, and treats. Uh, and the toilets are just over there. And we're going to come back in 10 minutes. Thanks very much. Don't go home.
Okay, okay. Ben, I want some audio. What, left? None. Zero seconds. Oh, couple of audio issues. Just sit and watch that for a little bit. What's that? Oh, mate, I don't know who's doing it. It's not me. I'm not doing it. No. Why did I immediately think that was good? My eyes. Oh, it is my That was my minion. That's a, yeah, that's definitely the sign. That's definitely the sign. Okay. Thank you, everybody. If you can... um. Make your way back to your seats now. I don't know who keeps doing it, Jeremy. It's nothing to do with me. It's stuck. It's stuck on loop. Was that hospital? No, his family just laughing at him. I'm just glad the dog's okay. I was worried about the dog. I'm just glad the dog's okay. Awesome. Okay, guys, I think we better kick things off. We are, we are running a little bit behind schedule. Nobody wants a repeat of that month. Oh, there was a month where it went on. Was getting, we're getting blankets out for everyone. Okay. Right, where's the clicker? Yeah, sorry, Joe. It, it keeps crashing. It's stuck on this. It can't, hasn't been able to move. Okay, so we're going to just jump straight back in. I'm glad that most of you are still here and haven't left. It was my, I wanted to just lock the doors. There's a rope. I know, I know. It is a school night, I suppose. Okay. So we're going to jump right in to our second spotlight talk for this evening. It's uh, really, really appreciate that these guys have been able to come along. It's uh, the Bridgewater Taunton College. Like I mentioned, the way in which all of us have a responsibility to work with education, working with young people, to do, to ensure that people that are leaving colleges have the right skills to. Um, to take up the jobs that a lot of us are advertising. So it's a really important thing. So what was the rock, scissors, paper? It was Dave, was it? So if we'd like to welcome Dave up um, to uh, give a few minutes on the bridge one. I like you did, you did it right from the back as well. Like, it's that you're really building this up. <laughs> well, next time we'll get dry ice and um, all kinds of stuff for you. There's a few wires. There you go. And I know. Well, it's not. Well, half of them have gone home now. Um, where's the microphone? There you go. For the live stream. Hello. 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 Yeah. Yep. Hey. Um, yeah. So, like uh, Shane said, I'm here from Bridgewater and Taunton College, uh, just to talk about a few things about what we do and University Centre Somerset, um, just to hopefully, basically, to plug, plug the college and what we do, what we're about. Um, so, I'm just going to talk through a few courses that we offer here. Uh, and what we're hoping to gain from these events and what we can sort of take from them and what we as a college and a university centre can offer to the local digital industry, basically. So here, 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 sorry, wrong button. Um, it's basically all the courses we offer. So we offer a wide range of things from level two all the way up to level six. Um, so level two is basically school leavers from 16 to 18, which don't get the grades to um, get onto a level three straight away. So it's students that come up with threes um, or in old money Ds. Not such thing as ABCs anymore, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, so a brand new course that I'm promoting myself, um, which I'm running in September, is something called T levels. Has anyone in here heard of T levels? I am not. You know, yeah, the government's doing their thing, promoting those. Nice. Um, so yeah, T levels is really what I'm here to promote. Um, it's a new government agenda for a new course that style that's coming out, brand new in September. I know a little bit. 
as much as every other college does in the country, which isn't much at the moment, but we'll get there. Um, so yeah, we offer everything right up to level six. We're doing a brand new degree um, that started this September, just gone, um, and hopefully what that degree will offer will be skills that um, our students need to get into, obviously, the digital and computing industry that hopefully employers and here will then take on board as well. So yeah, but there's lots of different things we offer, basically any, anything around sort of networking and cybersecurity, software development, web development, um, and also a few creative things, which I mainly do, a bit of, bit of 3D modeling, interaction design, and we're also dabbling our toes in virtual reality. Um, does anyone here do any virtual reality stuff? Oh, yeah, cool, nice. Yeah, okay, we're good. Yeah, cool, good, 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 good. Um, so yeah, basically we offer a lot of different things. So why am I here? Yeah, basically I said to plug ourselves and base, um, to, to build bridges, if you want, for employees that are in the digital and computing industry. So a lot of us, a lot of people still don't know us as the name that we are. A lot of people still refer to us as SCAT um, and we're not SCAT anymore. It was four years ago that we learned from Bridgewater College, so we're now called Bridgewater and Taunton College, and also University Centre Somerset is a big thing that's coming through as well. Um, but yeah, the main thing for me is um, the top right engaging with the local industry, so I was basically very nervous about coming up here tonight, so I haven't really spoken to anyone, um, but please come and speak to me about what we do at college, and I'll obviously I'll speak to you guys as well. Um, but it's about basically knowing what, as employers, that you want our students to know, and then we can build curriculums around that, so our students know what they need to do when they come and hopefully work for you. Um, so you don't have to spend time, money, training them, and you can, they can go straight into work, essentially, if you want. But also giving our students that opportunity as well. So I spoke to Ben, is it Ben? Ben, yeah, um, about work experience. And he was like, no, boo, work experience. You're not coming here, students. But we need the help from um, local employers. <laughs> <laughs> it was his words. That's what he said. And then I, I sort of switched off after you started talking about Visual Basic. I sort of just went away from that. Um, so yeah, so we yeah, so we need help from employers to get our students into work experience. So if you do have, I know obviously if you're a, a small employer that offers like say 10, 15, 20 people, you might not have time or the money to do that. But it really does help engage our students, not just in sort of classrooms. They can see everything that happens obviously in the working world. If they're coming straight from school to college to university, they have no idea what it's like out there in the working world. So the more that we can, as you guys can sort of help us to get our students out into employment and see what it's like would be yeah, really beneficial. So please, if you get some contact from myself or anyone from the college, please don't just be like, no, not for you. Please help us out. Yeah, that'd be good. And um, yeah, basically to let you guys know what we do. So what can we offer? Yeah, hopefully with obviously events like this and our networking events, um, we can get our students up to the standards that they need to be, and that's what our new uh, degree is doing right now. That started in September. Obviously, they're in, just in their first year, but after a couple of years' time when they finish in level six, they'll hopefully have the skills that they need to do whatever they need to do if they hopefully get employed by one of you lovely people. Um, and rather than, like I said, you guys taking the time to train them, they'll hopefully already have that. But there's lots of other things that we can offer. So if anyone needs like upskilling or anything like that, then we often can offer any sort of bespoke course, whether that be sort of daytimes, evenings, whatever it is you choose, we can sort of put every different things on offer. Um, schools as well, I don't know if anyone works with anyone's schools in here. Nah, bollocks to them. Um, <laughs> we're all about the college. Um, yes, yeah, so we can also obviously help schools as well. And also live projects, a lot of our degree students will do live projects for lots of different people, so like websites and things. If people don't know how to create websites or put those on board, or so I'm sure lots of people in there do, then that's a little uh, projects our students can do and they can put that together for you, free of charge. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so this is something, I don't know anything about apprenticeships, I don't work with apprenticeships, but we obviously do run apprenticeships at college, um, so if employers are here looking to get apprenticeships for students to do whatever you want students to do, um, and obviously the benefits that employers get with actually having an apprenticeship, I don't know, there's some sort of monetary value to it, I'm, I think, people, yeah, um, yeah, like I said, someone, someone that I know, or someone in college will be able to help you with that, so if you do want to know about apprenticeships, please just let me know, um, but the main reason I'm here is to plug my own event. So in a couple of weeks time, on the 13th of February, we'll be running our own, so a very similar event to this, which hopefully all of you will be able to attend. And there's a nice QR code here, so if you want to scan, yeah. People aren't getting their phones out, no? Okay, yeah. Please feel free to scan now. Um, but it's in a couple of weeks time, um, based at the University Centre Summit, which is in Taunton, some, what was Somerset College, SCAT. Um, so yeah, so please, it's just over the road if you are available in, in a couple of weeks' time from 7 to 8.30. And at the event, we'll basically be going through more in courses in a bit more detail, telling you a bit more about what the college can offer and also bring whatever you want to bring. Any questions you have, then bring those there because people higher up in the department will be there than me. 
Um, but yeah, please feel free to come along. There are also invites, paper invites at the back that we're hopefully going to leave, if that's okay. Yes. Yeah, so let it go. Um, there you go. So yeah, there's also paper invites that we'll leave by the door, so please feel free to pick one up um, on your way out. And that's basically what I've got to say. If that's, yeah? Good man. Thank so you. Let's Scott. <laughs> that is very sweaty. There we go. You're an absolute natural. Be banter in the pub later. Right. Where are we? Okay, so our final keynote speaker for this evening. No need for any crazy introduction with this person. I think she's known to so many. Um, she spoke about six months ago, one of our earlier events, actually. She's absolutely fantastic. Um, she's such, she's such, a, yeah, she's awesome. Joe Middleton. <laughs> Does my hair look okay? Yes. <laughs> Just posing. Ian, you got it? He's got it. Big button. Big button. All over it. Big button. <clears throat> okay. Thank you all for staying, everybody who hasn't gone home. Um, I appreciate it's late. So I'm going to just kind of give you seven really snappy tips to help you feel a bit less like social media is really dominating your life. Because I think nowadays we all can kind of feel a bit like, oh, we've got to be doing this and we've got to be doing this and we've got to be doing X, Y, and Z. And if we're not checking our phones and posting a story and doing something every five minutes, then it's all going to go to shit, which it isn't. So these, you're going to follow these tips and you'll barely have to do anything and it will all be fine. So just, I'm crackling, is that okay? Okay, maybe it's my actual voice. Um, just in case you don't know who I am, uh, I write a blog, it's called Slummy Single Mummy. Uh, I've been writing it since 2009, which I think means I've been writing it for three decades. Yeah, definitely going to say that. Um, <laughs> it started off as a parenting blog when my children were younger, and then as they got older and less keen on me sharing embarrassing stories about them, it's evolved into more of a kind of lifestyle, vaginal inconveniences type of um, blog. <laughs> uh, also do food and travel. Um, <laughs> These are a few of the brands that I work with. So my blog is my full-time job, and I make money by working with brands who want to reach audiences who perhaps they wouldn't be able to reach in a kind of authentic, natural way normally. So um, they get in touch with me, and I make jokes about them, and they pay me. It works out really well for me. don't know how well it works out for them. Um, part of running a blog, obviously, is I have to have a social media presence. And so this is me on, on Twitter. I'm Mummy Blogger on Twitter. If anyone wants to follow me or tweet me or um, it's just a selection of my, of my latest tweets. Um, so I kind of made a decision fairly early on that I was going to pick a social media platform and kind of do that one really well. So I picked Twitter because no one else wanted it. Um, and so I've spent quite a lot of time over the last 10 years building up a Twitter following and being like the parent blogger with the big Twitter following um, is, is my thing. Um, then I realized that all the cool kids are on Instagram, so I had to do that instead. Um, yeah. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Lovely. Okay. I've got a thing in each channel. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, then I, then I had to do Instagram because apparently that's what everyone does now. Um, I use Instagram for uh, doing things like posting pictures of baby Jerry. This is my grandson. Just to leave you a minute, just to think about that. Um, <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and I really love Instagram stories for posting pictures of my cats. These are my three cats. They're all named after fictional detectives. Um, 
You can't see Endeavour very clearly in here, but he's there on top of the shed, just keeping an eye out. And I, and I did a chart. I thought charts, chart might be good for a digital Taunton. So this is <laughs> the, it's a representation of how I spend my time. This is in bed with the cats. No, this is uh, my social media channel. So as you can see, Twitter is where I kind of do my business. And uh, Instagram, Facebook, and some others. Kind of boring. Um, so that's a bit about me, just so you know who I am. And the talk now. So how do you stop letting social media rule your life? These are my seven top tips. Switching hands. So number one, stop doing as much. It's kind of simple, isn't it? But I did, I did a little... Uh, do you know in like 2002 when everyone was doing those word chart things? I did one of those to represent my life. Um, <laughs> Just <laughs> so here's social media. So you can see it's quite small. Um, I think there's a bit of a myth that in order to be successful on social media, you have to be doing everything and posting every five minutes. And you really, really don't. You can turn it right back. Um, and because of this whole like 80-20 thing, which um, I'm sure you all know, um, but basically you spend five days a week doing stuff and only 20% of the stuff you ever do is actually interesting or valuable or creates any kind of results. So if you can figure out what that 20% is, you only have to work a day a week and then you still get all that blue. Um, <laughs> that's my business model. <laughs> it's quite simple. That's tip number one. Do less. Uh, tip number two, <clears throat> when you do post, make it relatable and authentic. And this is kind of one of those like cheesy things that everyone says, oh, we will be authentic on social media. Um, but, you know, it, people say it like that because it's true. So before you post anything, just kind of think to yourself, like, is it actually interesting? Does it entertain people or does it inform people? Those are kind of the two things that I try to think about. Um, and also, don't be afraid to be a little bit vulnerable with stuff. Um, and I think this applies even if you're a business. Like, you can still have a kind of behind the scenes, we cocked up doing this, but here's how we put it right um, type of content. Because people connect to people when they sense a vulnerability or when they see something that's human about you. And so I think the more you can incorporate that into your social media, the more you can kind of form those connections. So I'm kind of thinking less about that sort of perfect tweet that has two hashtags and a link and a picture and tags 10 people and has a location and more just about kind of stuff that talks about who you are or who, who your business is and what that represents and how you can connect with people um, through that. So here's, here's my most popular tweet in January. Uh, I'll read it out to you because it's really good. Um, <laughs> does anyone else really hate putting in petrol? Yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's awful, isn't it? So I've been driving around with the light on for ages, putting it off because it's so tedious. There are no hashtags on that or links or pictures or anything. But apparently, like everyone else in the world, also hates putting in petrol, which makes me wonder why no one has come up with some kind of system that's, like, that's an alternative to putting in petrol. Oh, yeah, somebody has. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, you have to plug them in. You have to plug them in, don't you? I think that would be the same. <laughs> or you'd wake up in the middle of the night and you'd be like, oh, I forgot to put the car on charge. So... Um, that was my most popular tweet in January. It had over 20,000 impressions, and loads of people liked it and replied, and they were all like, God, yeah, that's where I've got a husband. <laughs> yeah. I know. Do you know, like, I've never had a husband, but my dream husband fills the car up with petrol for me. <laughs> Employer husband. Oh, okay. I see. Just like a transactional. Brilliant. Cookies it is. Um, 
Here's another example. So this is the day that I discovered that the smell of pseudocreme is lavender. Fun fact for you. Pseudocreme has a very particular smell, and I had never realised before that it was lavender. And then when you start to think about it, it's obvious, because the writing is lavender-coloured. The ingredients say lavender. It's kind of a giveaway. And everyone was all over that. They were like, mind blown. Um, that is relatable content for parents. And then at Christmas, I made these, which are mince pies, using a special cat cutter. So they were also very popular. Um, so you're thinking about your target audience, and you're thinking about the kind of stuff that they're going to relate to and enjoy. I can't remember whether this is point three or part of point two, so we'll count them up at the end, and then we'll know. But this is a new point, or possibly not. Maybe two and a half. So as well as thinking about what you actually say, uh, it's good to think about your aesthetic. So this is just kind of like how you look and the images that you use and how consistent they are and what they say about you. And I think you can tell like a lot about a brand from kind of like just the really simple how they look. So I've got a couple of Instagram examples for you. So this is a local photographer. I mean, you can see, can't you? They're like, all her pictures look the same. She's like this lovely, calm, pure. I mean, she's so lovely. And she's just like, <laughs> she floats. <laughs> yeah, she's really young and full of energy. Um, uh, this is a blogger that I follow uh, in Bristol called Tiger Lily Quinn. And her thing is all about family life. So she's really colorful. She's bold. She's... She's got like lots going on and she's trying to kind of show this sort of fun family life. So you can see that even without the captions, you've already got like an idea of how these people are different and what, what they're about. And you can do this really simply on Instagram or on, on any platform. So one of the easiest ways to do it in Instagram is just to use the Instagram editing tools. Now, lots of you have probably used like the filters, like Valencia 2009. Um, everyone did that, didn't they? Or like the photo frames around. But um, if you go into the edit tab instead of filter, you can ch adjust all kinds of things like brightness, contrast, sharpening, all sorts. Like you can get really good quality editing just within Instagram. Um, there's also a really good app you can use called VSCO. Um, which does kind of similar editing things, but which also has loads and loads of presets that you can apply to your images. So if you've got like a particular feel that you want to go for, like, um, you know, like brightly colored or high contrast, you can apply the same preset um, set of editing to any photo. Um, and this is just kind of a, a useful link, might be... Um, it's an app called Later, and they do like a whole training thing on how to create your Instagram aesthetic. So if that floats your boat, get over there. Oh, this is like um, a really good example. This is a guy called Matt Inwood, and he's a food photographer. He takes all of these photos on his iPhone, and he edits them all in Instagram, and that is all he does. Like all of these photos are just iPhone Instagram photos. He's ace. He does workshops, if you want to go on them. I made my photos look like that for like a whole day afterwards. <laughs> no, no, it wore off. Okay. Possibly point three or point four. Um, Twitter lists. Does anybody in here use Twitter lists? Oh, guys, guys, come on. Twitter is like one of the most basic social media tools, but it, I cannot emphasize enough what a difference Twitter lists have made to my life. They're so easy to set up. So you just go into your little menu at the side, lists. Um, there's a button up there somewhere off the screen. It's like create a new list. You can add people to it. You can call them like insulting names and make it private, like people I hate. Um, just make got the padlock thing. <laughs> You can, um, if you're too lazy to set up your own list, you can subscribe to other people's lists. So if other people, somebody else has set up like Somerset businesses, you can find that and you can subscribe to it. Um, and it just makes Twitter so much more manageable. So instead of going onto Twitter 
and having your home feed, which is just like speed of light refreshing with tweets about Brexit, and it's like, no, it's overwhelming. You can, you can either use Twitter to go in directly and look at your list, or you can use something like um, TweetDeck. This is TweetDeck. Uh, it's completely free to use. It's all like linked up to Twitter. And you can arrange your lists in columns. So um, I have a column for my notifications. I have a column for what I call my home feed, but it's actually just the people I really like. Um, so if you're on that, then you're really special. <laughs> no one here is. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You all are. Um, <laughs> There's a Somerset column. I especially put in a hashtag digital Taunton column to make it look like I was, you know. Um, <laughs> anything you want, you can make as a column. And what that means is when you've got 10 minutes, rather than going into Twitter and being totally overwhelmed by information, you can think, okay, what I really need to do is engage with local businesses in my area, you know, like Taunton Independent Quarter. I want to spend 10 minutes um, retweeting stuff from them. I want to reply to conversations that they're having. And you can be really, really focused and feel like you've got 10 minutes of really useful work out of Twitter. Honestly. Yeah, I use this on the desktop. But you could easily set up the lists on your phone and then just go into lists and pick a list. Um, it just it saves so much time, and it's I, I cannot stress enough how much you will love lists when you have all gone home immediately after this and made at least ten. <clears throat> you got lists. Well done. We'll do it now. Okay, the next one. Totally lost count now. Um, is images. So images are incredibly important, obviously, on social media. We all know this. I found some stats to back it up. Have a read through if you want. The, the bottom one, I think, is the most interesting. But essentially, the more you use images, <laughs> they're, they're all on the internet. I don't know why you're laughing. Um, yeah. The more you use images, the more engagement you're going to get. It's cut, you, know, you, you can add numbers to it, you can do whatever you like, but we all know if we're scrolling through Twitter or we're looking through Facebook and something has an image attached to it, it's going to grab our attention more than something that doesn't. Um, if you're worried about not being able to take your own photos, then there's no excuse because there's loads of like really good free photo sites. This is one of my favorites that I use for blog posts. It's called Unsplash. Um, did a quick search there for coffee and for cats. I mean, just random. Um, and as you can see, they're really high quality images. Um, you can use them without any credit. So you could even put them on Instagram, pretend you took them yourself if you want to. <coughs> so that's a really good site. Definitely recommend that one. Um, the other site that I use a lot for creating images and graphics is called Canva. Again, it's another free tool. Um, one of the really good things about Canva is that it, ca it has a loads of like preset templates. So if you want to create an image for Twitter, it's got all the right dimensions. Or if you want an Instagram post or whatever it is you want, um, you can have it there, like ready in the right shape. Um, I use it for creating all sorts of things. So I might take some like food photos and add text to make them Pinterestable. It's <laughs> definitely a word. Um, creating any kind of images for my blog. This is an interesting image I made for a post about I call Tinder Bingo. I uh, don't know if anyone ever goes on Tinder, but these are some of the things that um, I like to tick off. Uh, that are photos that um, men often have. So classic gym selfie featuring heavy looking weights, embracing a large fish, that kind of thing. <laughs> so it's what all the men on Tinder do. So that is isn't definitely another tool that I recommend if you want to create your own images or graphics for things called Canva. Uh, right, next point. 
uh, is to plan and schedule all of your content in one go. So rather than panicking every day that you have to do another Instagram post or, oh God, I haven't tweeted in eight hours. I've got to do something about it. It might be that it's much more practical and much more efficient for your business to have two hours or three hours or half a day or whatever it might be a week where you say, right, I'm going to schedule everything. I'm going to get it all done. Then I don't have to think about it all week. And there are a lot of tools that you can do this with. So I've just picked one that I think is particularly good and also has a free version. Um, so you can have a player back with it. And then if it doesn't suit you, you've not lost anything. And it's called uh, Later. Um, I think it might have started off just as Instagram, but you can now link up lots of different accounts. So you can have Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, probably more, I don't know. Um, you can upload all of your images, so you have a media library with all of your cats, just all in one place. And, and then you basically, you can just drag and drop um, your images into different slots in your calendar for all the different platforms. Uh, you can add captions, you can add your hashtags, you can save captions if you want to. So if you're on Instagram and you have like a set of 20 hashtags that you always use for a particular you know, for food photos and another 20 that you use for something else, you can save them and then just add them to your captions really easily. And then if you have a um, business Instagram account, you can set up the time and it will just post it automatically for you and you literally have to do nothing else. If you have a personal account, it won't automatically post it, but it, you can set it up to send you a reminder. So it's kind of there ready to go and you just get a little thing and you post it. So it's really good. Um, it also gives you some analytics. So it will give you like a, a color coding, I don't know, um, and kind of give you like a summary of your latest posts and how many likes and how many comments. So th you can see them easily. Um, oh, and also in the calendar view, you can also go into like a preview of Instagram where you, it get, comes up looking like your phone and you can drag your photos into your phone and see how they look in the grid so you can make sure you've got like a good color balance and um, yeah, it's really good. So the basic package of this is free where you get like one social channel, one of each social channel and then the upgrades are actually really reasonable and you get quite a lot with the free version. So it's definitely worth having a play about with and getting everything done in one go. So following on from that, um, another tip is to make good use of the analytics and there are, each of the social media platforms has like inbuilt analytics that are actually really useful. So um, as you could use something like later and look at their analytics, but Instagram also has its own analytics. Um, Twitter analytics does like loads of cool stuff which shows you, so the, there's my petrol tweet, which was my top tweet for January, tells you like who all the cool people who are following you, like tweet impressions, like everything gives you loads of information. It will tell you which of your tweets have been most popular. This is impressions and then engagements and engagement rates. Um, and then most of the channels, this one's Facebook, most of the channels will tell you also about your audience. So as you can see, my target audience is me, uh, women 35 to 44. That is me. Also, men in Nigeria. <laughs> I'm really popular with men in Nigeria. <laughs> I once had a message from a guy in Nigeria saying, I've showed you your photo to my son and he agrees that you would make a good mother. <laughs> <laughs> but what's really good about looking at your analytics is it helps you to focus in on who exactly you're talking to. And uh, what you'll often find is that the people you're talking to will vary by platform. So on Facebook, my um, men to women ratio is very different than it would be on Twitter. So I've got a lot of women on Facebook, fewer women on Twitter. Um, and so you can kind of target content accordingly if you're smart, if you're not doing my point one. Um, and, that, and the analytic stuff comes back then to this 80-20 rule. So if you know what content is working well for you, 
just do more of that. And then you look at the stuff that did really badly, do less of that. I'm such an expert. <coughs> okay, my final point before you all go home to bed, is to experiment with new things if you want to, but don't feel bad if you don't. And there's always like something that is the next best thing on social media. So there was like a few years ago, all of the parent bloggers suddenly were on Snapchat. Um, and I said to my oldest daughter, like, should I be on Snapchat? And she said, no, it's just middle-aged women think that they're cool. They're going on Snapchat, like, don't bother. And lo and behold, like a month later, none of the bloggers were on Snapchat. So it's good to have a play around with things if you want to, but don't feel like you have to. If you've got one platform or two platforms that work really well for you, that's fine. Um, if you do want to play around with stuff, I definitely recommend Instagram stories, just because they're so easy to use, and the engagement that you get on stories is, like, in my experience, is, is higher than any other platform. They're really simple to use, so you can take a simple picture of your favorite cat. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Don't tell the other cats. <laughs> You can add things to it, like polls, you can add hashtags, you can add little GIFs, you can do countdowns, quizzes, music, all sorts of things. If you don't want to start with a photo, you can do boomerangs, which is like, you know, cheers, do a little glass chink. Um, you can do zoom in on things, you can just add text. You, there's loads and loads of um, different options for stories. If you want to take your stories a little bit to the next level, there's an app called InStories, um, which is really fun. If you want to go and look at me on Instagram, which is Slummy Single Mummy, I did a few stories with this app this afternoon just to give you an idea of the variety. So the, my last three stories are all made using this app, like in literally 10 seconds each. I mean, it's not difficult, but they look kind of fun and different to the normal kind of Instagram story, so that's really fun to play around with. Um, that one is paid for. Can't remember how much it is, but it's not very much. You can always get a free trial, and you'll probably be bored with it in a few days anyway. And then there's TikTok, which I'm mentioning because Shane said, mention TikTok, and then we'll look really cool, and like we've got a finger on the pulse. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. No, I mean, TikTok, uh, that's, not, that's not true. Um, no, it's true. Um, <laughs> tick, like, people do use TikTok, so I've heard. Um, <laughs> not me, because I don't really understand it, but I, I think it uh, works for some people. This is an account that I really like, though, which is um, a photographer who shows the different stages of like the behind the scenes of his photography. So he's kind of got this, like in this one, he's got this leaf thing on a ring and then he shows how he takes a picture through it and then he shows the end result. It's all like in a video and it's really fun. Um, mainly it looks to me like it's young guys like doing pranks, but you never know, have a play. Um, oh, I put down the clicker. Uh, and that's the end. So thank you all for staying. <laughs> Yeah, do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, right, yeah. I, need to I can project. <laughs> no, it's fine, actually. Well, I'll, maybe I'll stand close and you can just kind of shout into my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quick, take a picture. Any questions at all? Before we worry about if there needs to be questions. Hello. Um, how much time when you started out being a blogger did you actually have to put into your social media so how much effort to start with versus now um to get you know you you, you become a brand yeah. and then how much now do you have to put in versus from the start that's a good question and um i guess to start with i did have to put in more a little bit more energy than i do now but i reckon even if you're starting out like the rules here would still apply like there's no point just churning out masses of 
content that isn't relatable and that doesn't have good images and that you know you don't need to be doing it every single day when you could be planning and scheduling it in advance yeah. so yes when you're starting out you probably want like more interactions and to get into more conversations and mm -hmm. to be kind of proactively finding people to follow but that doesn't necessarily have to take up masses of time i don't think um and in terms of where you are now if you wanted to keep on being a slave and push yourself would it would you go further or you, does that make sense yeah i think like ultimately i'm fairly lazy <laughs> so <laughs> like it's Social media is one of those things that like you could spend all day, every day doing it and, you know, following people and going and commenting on other people's posts all the time and getting involved in pods and doing all kinds of things. Like, you could do as much or as little um, as you want to. For me, being self-employed was always about wanting to work less. And so, like, I don't want to be spending loads of time doing it, to be honest. Yeah. Like, I... If I wanted to be doing it all the time, I would get a job in social media. Like I want to do what I feel is like a good level to maintain yeah, definitely. decent engagement, but still be able to have brunch. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the, the ratio, yeah. <laughs> cool. Everyone wants to go home now, Shane. Hi. Um, just wanted to see, because you mentioned a lot of the um, social medias there, and you seem to bypass YouTube. I was wondering if that was a conscious decision um, for you not wanting to put yourself... I mean, you're, you're a beautiful lady. Um, you, Thank you, you very could much. Go on it. You know, no, no worries. I'm not on <laughs> Tinder, though, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, you, you, you could certainly engage with the audience in a, in a slightly different way. So was that a conscious decision or, or not? Um, Yes, it's conscious in that I really dislike video editing and find it really time consuming and I'm not very good at it. So um, I really like being in front of the camera. So I do quite a lot of work with brands where I just rock up somewhere and say stuff and somebody else does all the hard work. Like I'm totally fine doing that. But generally, like putting together a video myself, I just find tedious and they always look so terrible at the end so yeah I've, I guess I've chosen to concentrate my efforts on um, platforms where I feel a bit more competent I've got it's, not, it's less of a question and more of a uh, uh, an answer to the um, petrol thing I actually okay. I, I did actually t I did actually put a reply in but I'm obviously not in one of those. See what, what no, 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 I'm obviously not in the favourite column. Right? <laughs> um, so there's a hack on the petrol, right? Most petrol lids, you can squeeze underneath the trigger of the handle. So you just squeeze your petrol lid under the trigger and sit in the car and the petrol just comes out. Simple. Um, <laughs> I, no, no, that, well, I, I mean, it's quite so dangerous, to be honest. Uh, How does it stop? Will you just get back the, in the, the car? The petrol will just stop automatically when the tank's... Ah, yeah, but you still have to, like, pull up at the petrol station and get out. And once you're that's out, you might as well just stand there. Yeah, but that's when you're going to need Kenda's advice. Oh. You're going to need to... I, I pass the time by uh, reading everything that I can see with insight. Or sometimes I sing nursery rhymes to myself. I don't know. <laughs> More questions? Hi there. There's, uh, there's a lot of people out there doing social media and being influencers, etc. Um, you say you monetize by um, working with certain brands. Is that the only way that you've monetized? Uh, yeah, it's pretty much. Um, so a lot of people doing similar things to me do monetize a lot through affiliate links or um, like banner ads or click ads and that kind of thing. Um, but that's always kind of seemed like it would probably be too much hard work for me. Like, because if you've got an affiliate link, you've got to be promoting it all the time. And, um, yeah, so I, I tend to just stick with more of the, like, advertorial sponsored blog posts because that has the best return for me. But there are loads of different ways that people do. Like, there's a guy that I chat to on Twitter a lot, and he, um, he basically does no work at all. He just has affiliate links for stuff. And then he goes to Disneyland and... Like, but he's massively into, like, he's really good at SEO and he's really good at promoting the affiliate links and that's not really my strengths. 
And, and how did you go from that journey, it's similar to the kind of question with this chap here, um, from effectively going from nothing um, and building yourself up to a point where people want to advertise through you? Well, I mean, partly luck really and that when I started blogging in 2009 not many other people were doing it not in the same way so it was easier to establish myself then and kind of build up a following and build a reputation when the, the marketplace was much less crowded um, I set my blog up because I was um, I just left a job and I wanted to go into journalism and so I set the blog up as like a marketing tool for that really and so then when brands did start to think about influencer marketing, I was just well positioned, I think, uh, to be able to exploit that. Cool. Thank you. Favourite brand of 2019? Um, I don't know. Like... Honestly, I just forget. Like, um, do you know? I did this really good campaign with um, <laughs> what was the bank? What was the bank? Visa. Visa. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with Visa, who were um, doing their like uh, high street shopping independence uh, campaign in the run up to Christmas. And now I don't know if you know. There's a little gift shop just over in the <laughs> sort of. It's, uh, but, but ro Rocket and Bird. Um, <laughs> so I, I went in and uh, filmed a, a fun video with them that, that I then had to refilm completely because we used Barbies and that was like a brand and Visa were like, oh, can't really brands. Uh, so they were really fun to work with. I don't know if you know them, but yeah, that was a nice campaign. Also... Coming up in 2020, I've got baby Joey, his first brand deal with a baby food company. So my one of my latest posts on Instagram will be Joey eating some baby food. So if you could all go and like that, because that's an ad. Um, <laughs> and we're going to be working with them all through the year as uh, Joey turns into a little boy. Thank you ever so much for that, Joe. Um, wanted uh, wanted Joe to um, to speak this month because I think myself included. One of my New Year's resolutions, I think, for a lot of people is I'm going to finally embrace social media. I'm finally going to really do it. And then, like, it's the first of January, and you've got all your posts queued up, and you're all good to go. And then it's like. 17th of January and now you're filled with dread and anxiety because you're eight days behind and what happened and so uh, hopefully there was a few things that you could take away from that uh, you know I, I, the idea of you know not having to to go as crazy as what you think you might need to go so thank you ever so much for that Joe right so we're just going to wrap up now and, and apologies that we've overran and thank you for staying with us really really appreciate it so our next event is going to be the 27th of Feb uh, same same uh, same time same place seven o'clock and um, keep an eye out on meetup.com for the announcements of the speakers I think we thing now where we want to like kind of drip feed it um so um i don't know keep everyone on their toes and um and also keep an eye on meetup.com for the announcement of the dt tech details um if there's any pizza left at the back of the room feel free to help yourself and um go crazy is there any ben's probably eating it all to be fair oh he's gonna and uh, and thank you ever so much for those signed in on the live stream as well i'm i'm sure um it's, uh, it's behaved itself. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much, and see you again next time. Thank you.